Good evening, and thank you all for joining us. We're going to get started now as people continue to trickle in. I'm Heather Duran, a program curator at Smithsonian Associates, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's program, Social Networks in Ancient Athens, Clues to a Classical Creative Hotspot. To our members, a sincere thank you. Now more than ever, it is your support that keeps us going. As many of you know, Smithsonian Associates is not federally funded and relies entirely on donations and membership support to bridge the gap between program expenses and ticket revenue. To anyone who might be new to Smithsonian Associates, welcome. And I invite you to explore the wide range of programs that we offer and to consider becoming a member to support our work in bringing you hundreds of trusted learning experiences every year. You can find out about those events and more on our website, smithsonianassociates.org, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We have also posted a link in the chat box, which brings me to my next item of business. Before turning to our speaker this evening, I want to quickly point out a few key features of your virtual experience on Zoom. Let me direct your attention to the chat box on your toolbar. This is where we will post relevant information and links throughout the program. Also on the toolbar is the Q&A box. This is where we will draw questions from during the Q&A session following the presentation. My colleagues are monitoring this area, so we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation and we'll get to as many as possible. Please note that only the speaker and Smithsonian Associates staff are able to view your questions. You may also have noticed that this program includes closed captioning, which you can choose to hide by clicking closed caption on the toolbar. If you are using a tablet or smartphone, you may need to switch the captions off in your Zoom settings. Following the program, please take a minute to complete the anonymous exit survey. We value and appreciate your feedback. Finally, let me tell you about our speaker this evening. Dr. Diane Harris-Klein is an Associate Professor of History at George Washington University, where she teaches courses on the archaeology, history, and culture of the ancient Greek civilization. Professor Klein holds a BA from Stanford in Classics and her PhD from Princeton in a program in Classical Archaeology. She has won two Ful Fulbright Fellowships to live in Greece, most recently in 2019 on the island of Crete, among other awards. She is the author of two books. Her most recent is called The Greeks in Illustrated History. Professor Klein's current research investigates the social networks through which ideas could flow in, in ancient Greece. She has published on the social networks of Alexander the Great, Pericles, Socrates, and more. And tonight she will share with us her findings and experiences in explaining what she thinks made the Greeks so creative and innovative. We're so excited to have Diane here with us this evening. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Diane Harris-Klein. Thank you, thank you, Heather. It is so great to be here with Smithsonian Associates. I should say that this is my 20th anniversary of being involved with Smithsonian Associates, both as a member and as a speaker, as well as uh, Smithsonian Journeys um, and uh, taking people on cruises to Greece and other destinations. Uh, it is also my 45th year of being fascinated by the ancient Greeks. I think it uh, started in part with reading Edith Hamilton's The Greek Way, and those of you who are of a, a certain age uh, will appreciate that book and remember it well. I went back to look at it a few years ago, and it's actually quite sophisticated, uh, but it has been so influential on so many people. So I thought it might be fun to start with a poll, um, if we can, to think, uh, to take yourself back to um, what you associate with the ancient Greeks. Uh, so was it their architecture, the, the Acropolis, uh, is it philosophy, theater, the Olympics? So you have some choices here. I know the writing is small, so I will read them for you. Uh, when you think of the ancient Greeks, what comes to mind first? Their architecture, the Parthenon, the Olympic Games, inventing track and field, the arts, sculpture, Greek vases, Greek tragedy, lyric poetry, uh, or their myths, epics like the Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, and in addition, you can go down to, do you think of any of these also? The philosophers, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, the development of democracy and political science, science and medicine, the Hippocratic Oath among others, the great historians, Herodotus and Thucydides. So make your selections and we'll wait a few moments. And 
see what we come up with as a group. When you have voted, you can X out the box at the top right. How are we doing with the poll, Heather? We're at about 79%. Oh, okay. You have just a few more seconds. Press that button in front of you. Get your vote in. I'm assuming you're here because it is not your first time of hearing about the ancient Greeks, that there's a draw for you. So make a selection and then we'll see what we can. It looks like we've kind of slowed in the votes. So okay, let's go that. ahead. Can you show the results? Drum roll, please. Oh, look at this. So the myths win by a landslide, sort of. <laughs> and the philosophers, in other words, their ideas, not so much their physical remains, but what they've left for us intellectually and in our, in our imagination which I really love. That's fantastic. Thank you for participating. What I appreciate most about the Greeks is their creativity. Sorry. Uh, their creativity, their inventions, their innovations, their discoveries, their big ideas, like you. Uh, what conditions made them so successful? This is something I've been wondering about for many years and started working on in earnest, I would say um, about 10 years ago. So for me, what I find interesting is the um, importance of their friendships, which I did not expect to find when I first began to research this. So here's the wide array of inventions uh, of the ancient Greeks, and of course there are far more uh, and yet, um, we're not sure what their secret sauce was. What made them so unique and special that their contributions, and we're talking about um, inventions of the 6th, 5th, and 4th centuries BC, that is 2,500 years ago, that are still so much a part of our own world. How'd they do it? That's my question. So uh, I'm looking then not just at friendships, but how friends of friends are linked together into clusters and how clusters are part of networks and networks are part of complex systems. How are we all bound together? So you know that sociologists have been studying this for some time and they think that the city where you choose to live and who you date or marry, the job you choose, the clothes you wear, that you think these are your choices, but in fact, they are not predetermined, but to some extent determined by your social networks, what the people closest to you, those around you are doing, and even those two degrees out, that's friend of a friend level and three degrees out. Uh, so I'd like to explore that for ancient Greece. And this is something that I've been working on independently in a way, because I'm the first to actually try social network analysis on the ancient Greeks. And so in this question of how did they become so creative? What was their secret? I've come up with these um, essential points and social networks are just the first, uh, th but they're essential for how good ideas can flow through a community. It's not necessarily the invention of the idea, but it enables ideas to flow quickly and easily, friend of a friend of a friend through a community. Travel and trade is also important because that's how new ideas get to the edges of the network. 
kind of flow inwards, and how ideas about being Greek and the elements of Greek culture and society were shared throughout the Mediterranean and Black Seas. I'll show you a map in a moment and we'll come back to that. I think that an interest in using technology for problem solving is also a key to creativity and innovation and uh, that there are plenty of opportunities for collaboration. It's harder to be inventive, innovative, and creative alone, better in company. A level of education uh, is important, and I'm going to share with you the secret of uh, a, a, a Greek style education, which is unique for the ancient world. A competitive spirit helps, that is building the better mousetrap that idea of always trying to move something forward. And this is found in uh, Greek athletics, for example, as well, uh, and in playwrights who want to, to write a better play. Then uh, one element that I find intriguing about the ancient Greeks is that they surround themselves with sensual stimulation, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, no one needs all that sculpture or the decorated paintings on vases. The vase itself can hold water, whether it's decorated or not. Our walls are generally speaking, in offices anyway, white or beige. They're not multicolored the way the Greeks are, with these tapestries and mosaics on the floor. They seem to want to surround themselves with rich sensual stimulation, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. And finally, I want to show that um, the creativity, particularly in larger endeavors, thrives in self-organizing systems where individuals have some freedom to make decisions, and uh, especially in their work and, and in the choices they can make in their work. So these are the elements I want to present with you tonight, but the very first thing we absolutely must do is establish where is ancient Greece? Where is ancient Greece? So modern Greece is here in the Balkan Peninsula and includes the island of Crete. My circle couldn't quite get it. Um, but that is not ancient Greece. In fact, there was no such thing as a country called ancient Greece or even Greece. Instead, Greek cities the polis, city-states, were always independent and autonomous, but saw that they had cultural um, commonalities with their neighbors and their neighbors' neighbors. And from pretty early on, about the end of the 8th century BC, 730 BC to 600 or so, the Greeks began to leave this mainland area that's in the circle and create colonies fractals of their home cities, which they then called the mother city, the metropolis, polis, metro, mother. These were autonomous from the start, having to create their own trade networks and their treaties with local communities. And many of these developed to be larger and even wealthier than their mothers. They settled everywhere you see in red these are Greeks in Spain, France, Italy, Croatia and Albania, Libya, Cyprus, Anatolia, and then going up through the Dardanelles or ancient Hellespont up to Byzantium, modern Istanbul. They also settled in the Black Sea region, going clockwise Romania and Bulgaria and the Crimean Peninsula of the Ukraine has Greek cities on it and the coast of Georgia. Why did they do this? Well, it's a complicated answer, but what we find is that by the time these are established, Greek civilization is also established. And everywhere that you saw in red, they have temples and Greek architecture like this. They have sport, drama, love of stories, polytheism, that is myths about multiple gods and goddesses, and uh, were enriching themselves with the arts. 
they also shared common cultural values, I guess we'd call them hospitality. Autonomy, being independent, was important to them. Openness to new ideas and new people. Um, interest in trade and travel. They had an inherent resistance to tyranny. And they valued free speech. The Greeks generally, the Hellenes, as they would call themselves, Hellas is the word for Greece for them. Our word, Greece, comes from what the Romans called them in Latin, the Graeci, not a very pretty word. But the Hellenes um, are known more for their cleverness, for their inventiveness, uh, ability kind of to get out of scraps using their uh, brains rather than brute strength. Greek cities were never united, in other words, until Alexander the Great and his father Philip conquered them at the Battle of Chironia in 338 BC, in part because there were geographical boundaries, um, islands, mountain ranges, uh, and each city protected its territory. So there would be an urban core and then the farmland and sort of outer parts of it which is why we translate their word, polis, as city hyphen state. And our word politics, their politica, are the things having to do with a polis. And each of them chose to be democratic or oligarchic or monarchic or a combination, always self-governing and independent. But every Greek city or uh, polis, let's call them now, shared a common culture. So my research interest in understanding the relationships between the Greeks spread out as they are um, is, um, is, is based in wanting to understand the communities and how tight knit or loose they are. And I started using social network analysis because I just thought that this might have something to do with their culture and the creative bent that it takes. So through the various associations between people, their affiliations and identities, their tribal units, and these cultural practices, uh, Greek men, in particular, we're talking about the ones that are written about, so I have to say men, mixed and mingled with one another in a great variety of ways. They got to know each other privately and publicly. And through these clusters, information and ideas passed. So as I said, I'm among the first to apply social network analysis to the ancient world and the first to try to do it for the classical Greeks, for the ancient Greeks. And I got the idea because I know that there are about 10,000 names that we know from uh, ancient Greece, from literature, and also from Greek inscriptions, that is carvings on stone or painted writing on Greek vases. And so once I kind of got the idea, I began to experiment. And my first experiment was on Alexander the Great. You can see in the upper right, one of my first um, diagrams. I'm going to call these now sociograms. That's the technical term for these graphs. And below it, you can also see another one of my um, sociograms for Alexander, where we see him in, in the, where all of the red lines kind of coalesce into that one node in the middle. That's Alexander. And each of those dots, or nodes, as we'll call them, are names of Macedonians in the blue ring, the blue spiral. And those red lines, or edges, as they're called, the links between the nodes, they're going out to 23 different ethnic groups that he conquered and that became part of the empire of Alexander the Great. So when we study a network, I'll come back to Socrates later on the left. Uh, when we study a network, there are two things that I look for. One is the characteristic of the whole network. What patterns can I see? How can I understand the whole? And then the other is the role each individual plays inside the network. 
who are the people in the innermost circle who hold the network together who work as bridges or brokers across the clusters so what i'd like to do is just review a few network principles using to begin with the famous example of six degrees of kevin bacon are you familiar with this so it's thought that everyone in the world is connected in some way um, within six degrees, six degrees of separation. One degree is me and my family, me and the people I know directly. And then two degrees are the people that they know directly. So my parents have friends when I was a child that I didn't know them. They're two degrees away from me. Uh, when I go and spend the night with their daughter, then they become one to me because I know the mother who gave us dinner, tucked us in. So it's always dynamic. And sometimes uh, it grows really quickly. Let's say that we're at a party and we're circulating and we're meeting all sorts of people. They become our one degrees, but everyone they know becomes our two degrees. And by the time you're our age, <laughs> you know a lot of people. You don't remember them all, but you certainly have met a lot of people and know them in one degree. And think if each of those people have networks as big as yours, yeah, we're gonna get to Kevin Bacon in six hops. Not just the movie stars, but probably us. But the brain can't remember every single person that you've ever met and nor could we ever calculate our two degrees of all the people they've ever met. So let me give you a very small diagram. It's a lot easier to look at. So here's Kevin Bacon with the red star, and we're looking at three clusters inside a network, a network diagram, a sociogram. And what we have are three clusters that are basically three movies and the actors that appeared in those movies. So because this is a, a network diagram about Kevin Bacon, I've starred him and he's the, he's the lead. And we're looking at Animal House with John Belushi and Don, Donald Sutherland there. He's also connected to Bill Paxton and Tom Hanks as first degree uh, associates, as well as Gary Sinise. I'm gonna use my cursor, I hope you can see it, um, where you're able to see that they're all one degrees but you know what? Madonna is two degrees. You see that? Through Tom Hanks up to Madonna. So um, let's take a look then at Tom Hanks for a moment. He actually has a more important role in this network for being a kind of bridge or connector. Donald Sutherland cannot get to Madonna without going one hop second degree, and now third degree. Tom Hanks is the gatekeeper there. Agreed? So this whole group, this, this um, cluster, let's call it, and this cluster are all pretty much dependent on Tom Hanks. And equally here, Kevin Bacon for this group. So what happens then if Tom Hanks disappears? The network breaks into two. There's no chance Donald Sutherland will ever meet Madonna without Tom Hanks. Agreed? So this is where social network analysis gets practical. There are 130 different fields, different businesses, different industries that use social network analysis. Some are in the marketing, like how do we amplify and spread a new product into a community, but others are such as these. On the left, you have gangs in purple in Los Angeles, and this is the police trying to figure out how can we break up these gangs? And do you see that there's a Tom Hanks there in the hazard group? And if you could eliminate that little gang, the rest of the gang would be bifurcated, which is a good thing. 
you'd be breaking it apart. On the right are the four airplanes that went down at 9-11. Green is the flight, the airplane that crashed into the World Trade Center North. Pink is World Trade Center South. Um, red is the Pentagon and blue is the field in Pennsylvania. As you might remember, it was um, masterminded so that no one really knew the whole plan. In other words, so if someone from the pink got caught, they would have no way of knowing what red, blue, and green were doing, and therefore those could continue. Right? For a few nodes, two nodes in particular. And this is a diagram that was made from publicly accessible, unclassified newspaper articles that came out um, that week by an organizational development consultant named Valdi Scribs, who plotted how each of those knew each other. And what we see is that there's one fellow, Zia Jara, who does have access to a green, a pink, and a red. Therefore, information could have come to him or flowed out, but he would be the Tom Hanks, he would be the broker but the other is Mohammed Atta, who may be more famous um, and who was thought to be one of the um, masterminds of 9-11. We look at, that's at the individual personal level. We look at the nature of the whole network too for patterns. So on the right, you're seeing the way that boys and girls in fourth grade talk to each other. And the boys and girls don't really talk to each other, although they are knitted in the middle. And that is similar to Congress. Fourth graders and Congress have a lot in common on how they vote doing their legislation, okay? So that's just the basic, basic outline of social networks. And now I'm going to go into the kinds of ways that the ancient Greeks um, developed and networks and how they matured. So the first example I'm going to use is to think about the social and religious and economic and technological and material ties related to trade in the Black Sea and Mediterranean Sea. And this uh, is lubricated by olive oil and wine carried in ships that were absolutely vital to ancient Greeks and their way of life. They depended on wine and olive oil for so many things, not just cooking, for their lamp lights, for medicine, for perfume, for sunscreen, um, for manufacturing, um, uh, for, for lamp light, so much. And within that, if you think of who made the wine, where wine comes from, the, the grape vine, who tends the vines, who presses the wine, who bottles it, who makes the bottles, the jars, the ceramics. And same for olive oil and presses and the, <laughs> um, the donkeys who have to move the great grinding mechanisms and so forth. So all of these human beings are connected with these seafarers, these traders, these merchants. And then there's the consumers. So you've got the manufacturers, You've got those who are shipping these things and trading these things. And then you actually have the, the, the clients, the consumers who take these things into their homes and then they resell them, re-gift them, consume them and so on. And then they're going by first carts on land and then ships at sea and then canoes up streams and rivers to get them to the more inland uh, polis. Uh, polices. So it's quite a, an amazing, um, phenomenal interwoven um, network. So we're going now to sort of explore how trade and travel 
opens up people to new ideas and, um, and introduces uh, ideas that then can take purchase. Now, some of you said that the ancient myths were important for um, why you're interested in the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Greeks were pretty interested in their own myths too. So while some Greeks were like itinerant traders, others migrated and traveled abroad, and they all lived this ancient life, a life that included knowing all the Greek myths and legends, all of them. And one of the most dominant is the story of the Odyssey by Homer, circulating in the middle of the 8th century BC, which is early for the classical period we associate with the 5th century BC. So the story of the Odyssey is a life at sea. It's 10 years of Odysseus and his men trying to return from the Trojan War and being tossed about and having various adventures. And uh, one of them is depicted here on a Greek water jar. And it's interesting because this is a watery scene and there's water inside it. So we see uh, a ship and we see men with oars, the oarsmen. And what Odysseus has said is, we're going to um, stop up your ears with wax. I don't want you to hear anything, but I want to hear the siren song. And if you hear the siren song, you will lose your ambition and you will stay put and um, want to uh, forget your life, your destiny. You'll just stay there. So he says, lash me uh, to the mast. Let me hear the siren song, but you all keep rowing and row for your life. And no matter what I say, keep rowing. So what I kind of love about this is we have a little social network here and we have kind of a, a, a I don't know, Tom Hanks figure, <laughs> um, an important fellow. We have the less important fellows here rowing. And the first one is looking back. Think for a moment what that's like, that you're in the front row, let's say you're trying to do a line dance or something, <laughs> and you're in the front row and you're like, am I doing it right, is what that gesture is. And then we have this fellow acting, acting kind of like a, a, a timekeeper, a coxswain, because they can't hear the beat. Usually you have a drum or, or a pipe to keep the beat for the oars to be in sync but they need a visual representation here, which I, I find kind of um, adorable. So we're going to look at some more Greek vases. They do represent um, kind of fantasy sometimes or real life sometimes. But in this case, um, it's this notion that uh, we all are naked strapped to the mast. And when we're lucky, we get to experience really high point things like the siren song. And no matter what, we have to keep going, whether we like it or not, our ship keeps sailing. So many of these vases have little hidden messages in them as well. So there's a lot of uh, sailing going back and forth as I have shown you, oops, sorry, here. Networks of itinerant traders and of uh, those living in the ports. And what we notice is they're largely autonomous, self-organizing systems. An individual captain will decide to take out his ship. He will recruit his men, usually those he knows, those from his own village or town, those who seem to be on the dock looking for work. However, he selects them. They begin to bond as a little cluster right on that ship. One looks behind to make sure he understands what's going on and they begin to feel in sync. And then uh, they participate in a much larger kind of uh, network where hundreds, thousands of ships are departing every day from many, many ports and doing the same thing with no supervision. People just took out their boats and did it when they wanted to. No oversight for even for developing the infrastructure, like once they're on land, who's gonna build the roads to get up into the river areas to take their pots further north. Nobody is in charge of that, but they do it because they need it and all independently. 
So it's a dynamic system with shifting partnerships, changes in quantities of the goods, changing prices and negotiation, all pretty independent. So let me first say that travel on land was a lonely business. It required you to bring your own supplies. You would camp on the mountain passes. Let's say that you want to go to Athens to the Olympics in Olympia, that's in the Peloponnese. It's just over land. You carry your food. You carry enough food for a month in your wagon. You're having to look for water en route. You might meet wild animals. Uh, you might meet robbers who knew that you'd be coming around that mountain bend and not be able to see them when they jump out. You had to be pretty self-sufficient. Whereas on the water, it's still dangerous, mind you, right? But um, it was social. Scoopers had to make their own relationship, uh, own arrangements, uh, I should say, with merchant ships because there weren't any ferries. And merchant ships would come into the harbor, come into the port, and there might be, say, five passengers that want to go where the next stop is, and they ask and they negotiate and they pay a little bit. Uh, and after a while, that merchant ship will kind of come in every Tuesday at two o'clock because he knows he's gonna get a little money if he does it more regularly. He might not get customers if he comes in at 5.30, right? When they're not expecting him. So that's sort of how these systems, you know, develop. And it becomes like a bus system with a map. And merchant ships are going to specific destinations and other merchant ships are going to other specific. And if you need to get from one to the other, you know which ship you're gonna take. But nobody's in charge. It's self-organizing. All right. So sea voyages were vital to the spread of Greek inventions of goods, but the sea was also a way to get transmission of ideas, of writing systems, of um, political practices, of philosophy ideas, and basically the Greek way of life. But we shouldn't just say sea voyages. We have to see the people on the boats. The sea didn't do it. The ships didn't do it. It was the network of people. First, those on board are a network. And when they dock, as soon as they come into port, it all changes. Let me explain. So merchants and mariners disembark. And people on the port key, meet them. And they might swap materials, swap stories, buy and sell from each other. And these social relationships grew from craftsmen and, and lenders and insurers and ship owners and captains and mariners and buyers waiting for their goods in all these ports. And so the Mediterranean and Black Seas brought all these people into parallel play for, for generations, really for centuries. These communities that lived on the water, that lived off the sea, they made their living by being inviting and even enticing to ships, that their uh, harbors were particularly welcoming, their port facilities, uh, their readiness with the, the donkeys and the ropes, their ability to repair ships or get some new sails and other kinds of materials quickly uh, that the merchant ship might need. So they begin to cater and then become a regular stop on these voyages. What this means then is that nothing can be done in this way at all without friendly relationships and hospitality. Nothing is more representative of ancient Greek culture than this concept of philoxenia or hospitality. Because the Greeks depended on the kindness of strangers when they traveled, hitching rides from merchant ships or eating and drinking in ports, asking to take a bath, um, 
drinking wine at night in, in the harbor uh, inns. Greeks shared an ethic of welcoming the stranger, the xenos. If you're familiar of the roots xenos and phobia, xenophobia, xenophobia, fear of foreigners. Here we have philo, like Philadelphia, brotherly love, philo, love of strangers. Um, yes, a stranger and foreigner is a friend you have just met. So this is called guest friendship. It is a very important value that is enforced by the gods. You can be smited by Zeus if you do not do this properly. It's a very ancient Greek sacred rule that courtesy and generosity must be shown to those who are far from home. Any stranger who rang the bell knock, 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 could be a god in disguise there to test the mortal homeowner's hospitality. So the widespread strong cultural norm of treating the stranger as a new friend, that's the only way all of this travel could have been sustained. So for the seafarers, receiving hospitality and welcome in each harbor was imperative. And yet, when you think about sea travel, you here see some sort of crude representations of oarsmen, difficult for them to properly clean themselves up as they approached a port to give a favorable enough first impression to customers for the merchandise and to get hospitality, that is to get a place to spend the night or at least take a bath. When the mariners uh, reached the shore and were able to find shelter, they must have felt such gratitude, just overwhelming deep relief, as we hear in the Odyssey, when in book six, um, he is taken to a palace with the princess Nausicaa. The social value then of believing that a stranger might be a god in disguise helped these seafarers get a meal, get a bath, and get a bed for the night. To varying degrees, the community on shore might evaluate and size up the mariners who are getting off their ships. And they might rate them or rank them uh, on a relative scale, um, on their behavior, their language, their dress, their hygiene. Each encounter would be different, perhaps beginning with some reservations, some skepticism, uh, moving towards civility and then maybe hospitality after the first few minutes of the encounter. And then uh, as the visit progresses, uh, each seafarer who goes offshore and has an experience like this and maybe is introduced to some people to drink during the night and then comes back on board, when he comes back on board, he has an expanded social network, does he not? He met new people, new one degrees that he didn't know before. Now there's a bit of overlap because all of the men on board this ship know each other. They're like a tight nuclear cluster, but then they fan out and they have all of these interesting different relationships. Uh, and even on board, you know, the, the wine and the olive oil and all of the tapestries and other things that they're going to sell, that's dynamic too. They load some off, they onboard other things to carry to the next port. Everything's dynamic about this. So everything's always in flux. One can never step in the same river twice, is what Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic philosopher, once said. You can return to a familiar town and find it changed. The people expand their social networks through the relationships they make with the new people they meet, the meals they share, the hospitality they experience, the memories they make by being together, the physical things they socially share and loan and sell and make and leave behind. 
their minds might be expanded too with new stories, new sights or images. Information is given to the sailors, news they might overhear. It might make them change their original itinerary. And so the mariners return to the ship personally changed, richer, poorer, wiser, cleaner, with new friends or customers and fresh supplies in their carry-on bags. Taking this to a higher level then, from the individual mariner to the ships, uh, the mariners all in one ship, to the many ships that are coming into harbor, to the people who are meeting them in the town, we get a much a higher level view in this sociogram. We're seeing that each ship is part of a, a larger system. Ships are connected to weavers or people who um, provide leather, do the tanning through sails, um, ropes, woodworkers, all of them. The ships are very, very complicated uh, in their own right and many hands contribute to its success. But then when it reaches ports, it is part of the economic system with investors and merchants. It is also a social thing, part of the sea, part of travel, part of infrastructure, part of technology. So we want to imagine that kind of dynamic change that we just saw in one harbor and the way one boat is part of a much larger system that is holding Greek culture together. And now you have to imagine this in every port that you see. Everywhere you see a red dot, we've got the Black Sea up here, the Hellespont coming down. We've got the Eastern Mediterranean with Cyprus, all the Greek islands very densely um, uh, rich with harbors in, in the area of Greece and the Aegean, going into the western side of Greece, up the Adriatic coast, all sorts of harbor towns, going to Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, around to the coast of uh, France, and then Spain, and all along the coast of Africa, where these are not all Greek ports, they are Phoenician, um, uh, Carthaginian ports, later and Egyptian, but all of these are stopping points for ships and all of that activity is happening. So on a daily basis, all of these kinds of uh, reproducing activities in a self-organizing system are uh, in play. We imagine ships coming into these ports, bringing in raw materials and finished products, staples and luxuries, inventions, new ideas, Greeks and non-Greeks, sharing ideas, meeting in these ports. Uh, it's quite a, an amazing dynamic thing that is going on for centuries. So I want to go back then to the individual, to the um, maker of a pot. Individual artists come from usually families of, of artists, of Potters. It's a traditional kind of learning that happens. It's a physical learning. It's folk learning. All of this is a very interesting, important way of knowing that is passed down through the centuries. So we're going to look here just at what happens, how many people touch a, a one one pot if it's filled with um, a liquid, let's say like wine or olive oil. So this is a chart that I made that shows a kind of chain of things that happen with one jar full of olive oil. So up at the top, you'll see the manufacturing of the olive oil, the care people take with the olive trees, the owner of the grove, how they collect the olives really communally, like the whole uh, neighborhood will come together to help. That these sacks of olives are collected and then put on the backs of donkeys or humans. And then they'll meet at the press other farmers who are doing the same thing. 
and the olives are pressed uh, in a kind of central area for the farms that are in the in the region. They collect the oil, but you cannot collect oil until you have sufficient jars to put this liquid in. So there's a strong relationship between potters like the man we just met and his family and the season of making the olive oil because you have to have made enough that you can catch the olive oil. They are codependent, they go together. Once you have the full amphorae of oil, it's used in so many ways, like I mentioned before, and that you can see on the lower part of the, of the chart. And then ultimately it has its own itinerary or its own life, its biography, and it ends up being emptied and reused. And maybe if it's very nice looking, dedicated in a sanctuary, that is a temple or put into a grave or trashed, uh, frankly. So they have their, their own lives. I and mean, this is technology. It's a kind of traditional folk technology that meets the industry of the olive oil. And these kinds of things are happening everywhere in all sorts of ways. So you might be familiar with the black figure vases and the red figure vases if you've studied ancient art at all. It's a peculiar thing that happened around 520 BC or so. Prior to that, vases tended to look like the ones on the left. If they were figured, meaning decorated with uh, figures, then the figures would be in silhouette in black uh, glaze. And then the red is really the natural color of the pot of the ceramics with a slight wash just to make it uh, sort of shiny. What happened is around 520 BC or so, suddenly artists began to play with, let's switch it. Let's make the black ground, the background, and make the figures in the red. And this allowed a more painterly approach you could use colors like their beards are painted red, for example, uh, and their um, definition of their fingers, for example, are not scratched in with a sharp tool, but are painted, which made it a little um, more graceful. So this is a new technology. And what I've been working on with a colleague of mine at the University of Arizona is um, to make this uh, social networks, to study and map the social networks of the potters and painters of ancient Athens. So this is our first experiment. And so you, you can see that the potters are in the lighter blue and the painters are in red. And the names either were painted on the pot itself or were given names by art historians. So we can see that at the bottom, there's a lot of pairs disconnected to the network, perhaps connected if we had just more evidence. But what is interesting are like these five, you have a potter and he works with four different painters. Or here, here's a painter who works with four different potters. And that potter works with this painter and that painter works with this potter and like a chain, which means that these are all the same date and all the same community at the same time. And then you have this kind of monstrous fish-like um, network, which has something like 32 different people who are mentioned, both potters and painters, who all are working within the same time period and doing these experimental things. So I think it is an opportunity for us to understand better how new technology and new ideas spread through networks. So this is one of the network charts that we've done. We just got a National Endowment for the Humanities grant for this work, for a digital humanities grant. And uh, this is um, one of the maps so that we can see the paths between the different kinds of techniques and patterns. And I'm also doing some of the statistical analysis for this same kind of work. I'm just putting it out there. Here you can uh, find from one part of the network, I kind of isolated these and found the painters and potters through which this um, transmission works so that you can get from the top to the bottom. It is more than six degrees of separation, however, 
but this is the um, type of work that we're going to be doing uh, together in particular this summer. Okay, so these are opportunities, these are examples of opportunities for collaboration um, at home. That is, here we're talking about the keramicus, which uh, you can, I, I hope, hear the word ceramic in there. Um, keramic, ceramic. Um, it's the area where the um, potters and painters worked, and it also became an important cemetery. So back at home, this is a complicated diagram. I'm going to try to make it uh, easy. There are all of these different amazing ways that Athenians would have known each other. Remembering that the polis is not just the city, the urban city of Athens, but its region. Its region is called Attica. It's a peninsula. It's about 25 miles. Um, and it uh, was occupied uh, by, a, I would say, there are about um, a thousand different little villages. OK? So these little tiny villages then kind of coalesce into regional areas. And so we have in the upper right, in the green, we have uh, little villages that are related to the harbor, that kind of deal with harbor things, that are fishermen, that sort of thing, and along the coast. And these are places where citizens could meet each other and know each other, and they are communities, small villages, uh, and would know each other. And the hills as well, which would be sort of grazing um, farmland, uh, you could be a shepherd, run into another shepherd, hang out, you know, in the hills. And then you have sort of the countryside uh, and the urban center. So all the parts of Attica are populated. And people get to know each other and they feel connected to each other. And then I put in here the palestras, which are wrestling halls, gymnasia, you know what that means, and schools. They're always all in one, and they would be scattered throughout because they are a kind of community center like many of our schools are today. Now over on the left is the more traditional, formal ways people know each other. So um, you start in the neighborhoods and in their deans, which is uh, kind of the official um, mm -hmm. Uh, that way that they're recognized by the state. Um, so they would have their father's name and their dean name, which is a little bigger than the village. And then their kinship networks, their dinos, and the file, um, their file, their tribe. Uh, it's not a real tribe. Um, it, they aren't necessarily related to each other at all, but it's a way they organized voting and calling people up for military service. So they pretended that they were descended from 10 heroes, and that's how they kind of communicated and voted and, and met in the assemblies and so on. And fratries, which are just what they sound like, fraternities. Then below, there were these shorter term, those are kind of permanent. These are shorter term opportunities to work together. So you'd serve in the Navy or in the Army. You might participate in religious ceremonies on a regular basis together. You might be um, a member of the Council of 500. These were uh, officers um, who were in service for only one year terms and then rotated out, but you would get to know them. The assemblies were these large gatherings, 10,000 people to uh, monthly to make the biggest decisions for everyone in the democracy. And you might be standing next to people and getting to know them too. And then you might serve on a jury in the courts and finally get one of the 700 civil service jobs, all of which were boards of 10, one from each file or tribe. So all, all jobs that we would think of as solo were boards of 10 um, committees and they still got stuff done. And then on the right are the ways you would know each other, meet each other, get together. If you were in the construction business, shipbuilding and repair, craftsmen, small manufacturers, small businesses, tax collection, 
farming, food processing, import, export, these kinds of businesses, of course, you would get your social connections too. So you really would have connections in all four of these quadrants um, if you were a, um, an ancient Athenian. And these place-based social ties, they tend to endure, they do. Uh, and they make a big city a little smaller, I should say too. Okay, so let's then look at the ways that Greek men, let's say of the middle and upper classes, might have spent their days, which also fostered unusually tight social networks. So we're going to look at two things. We're going to start with gymnasiums. I mentioned the palestra, the gymnasium and the school are all one. So we're going to start there and then we'll move to something called the symposium, which was a nightly uh, drinking party. And we will um, proceed. So first, I had mentioned at the beginning that one needed a high level of education um, to, 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 that it would be desirable at any rate to make the um, conditions positive for creativity and innovation. And this starts young. So we start with um, education. Greek boys would start school or get a tutor uh, after their mother had taught them the basics. And uh, a gymnasium would then be where they spent most of their days. Uh, there would be classrooms for learning poetry and history and oratory and math. Uh, how to make a fine speech was really important to get ahead. And um, so one third of the day would be spent on school, what we would call school. Another third would be spent on the body in exercise and Greek wrestling and doing track and field, which they invented. And then the third would be in music. So that's how they would spend their days. We are looking right now at the um, gymnasium complex at Olympia. Now Olympia was a one of the great Panhellenic sanctuaries. It was not a place um, where boys would be, you know, coming to school every day. It was a special place, but it is one of the best preserved in terms of its ground plan and the elevation of all of the columns. So I'm using it here. Uh, so um, here, you know, in this empty gymnasium, uh, we have to imagine the sounds of boys laughing and singing and reciting and and playing songs and uh, their tutors and trainers yelling at them and onlookers jeering or encouraging them. That's what we're going to see here. So just to take a, a, a kind of look at their education, again, it's tripartite. And we're looking here at the education of reading and writing on the right lower part. Yeah, it looks like a laptop. No, it is not a laptop. It is a wooden uh, writing box. The tray of it where our keyboard is, is recessed and in it is wax. And then the top is a wooden lid that keeps that wax fresh when you're done. You open it when you're writing and you're writing like he is with a stylus sharp, probably bone in, in, implement. And then when your lesson is over, you just like warm up your thumb, right? And just like rub it out and then it's recyclable. And so they, don't, they didn't have a lot of paper like we do. They used these wax tablets. You see music lessons up here at the right, on the top. I want you now to be paying attention to bearded and beardless figures. So bearded are maybe the teachers, uh, mature men, and the beardless, of course, are teens and lower. So here we have a bearded man in the middle who is training the fellow who's standing in front of him in the right, probably in declamation, in oration, in oratory, in how to speak. And so he's holding up a scroll with large letters and the boy is reading them hopefully well. Um, hanging on the wall is a lyre 
um, a stringed instrument with a tortoise shell for the back. And uh, you can see another boy behind the teacher play, uh, playing and so on. So these are very common representations of school. Uh, we also get um, representations, of course, of athletics. Um, so we're going now to the palestra for the wrestling. Um, you can see in the lower right frieze, you have a wrestling group here. And to the right, you have a man in fully clothed, right, with a robe and a stick. And they would beat the boys and try to get their form better, like whipping their leg into position and that sort of thing. Here we have a pancratiast. This is the worst form of combat sport that they had. Uh, and again, you have a trainer to the right who's going to be correcting their form with that stick. You also have a musician in the middle with that Greek key design on his robe. And he has a pan pipe, the double pipe uh, that he is um, playing. And Greek athletics, especially rhythmic ones like the um, long jump where you're running, those um, are always to music. And you see a discus player as well and a discus player up here on the right. And hanging behind him are jumping weights, which we have excavated at Olympia and other places. They are stone that look kind of like the old fashioned telephone. And apparently you would run, 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 run with them up like this, like you're lifting weights. And then just at the right moment, you hurl them behind you and release. And it helps you jump further. Uh, so that is hanging on a peg. And then this boy has a discus um, underneath and this T-shaped thing is a rake. And they had a sandy pit in the middle and they would rake it and uh, then be able to measure, right, the, um, the throws of the discus. They're naked, what the heck? Why don't we save that for the question and answer? Why are they naked? I'll answer that later. So let me just go on to say that all of this has a lot to do with sensual pleasure. And Greek men, well, okay. Yes, it has a lot to do with the competitive spirit and it, you know, making sure that boys grew up uh, to, to have it. Um, but it also included um, pleasure. And so it, this kind of thing you imagine is going on in villages in the big cities and everywhere you saw a port in that map of the Black Sea and Mediterranean and inland at all the cities that are inland, which that port map did not show. Everywhere had this. And it's not just for the kids. Men and young men hung out and enjoyed watching <laughs> voyeurs. Um, they enjoyed watching the boys in their lessons and helping out and volunteering. Uh, and this is something that de definitely the wealthier class, the leisure class could take advantage of, could do. Greek men generally were a particularly touchy bunch and um, they uh, like to slap each other on the back, shake hands, do all of that kind of thing. Um, so sensual pleasure, and uh, environments rich in sensual pleasure were definitely part of Greek society. So um, the symposiums. After your day is spent, you come at night to dinner parties. And there were dinner parties usually of eight to 15 men per night. A host would hold it, would invite guests. And as you can see, Beautiful young men would be serving your um, your liquid uh, libations and your uh, food, and also playing instruments and other things. Um, and the next night, you might be invited to a different person's house with seven other guys that you don't know. And another night, you'll be with a couple guys you know, and a couple you just met, and a new one. And this is going on every night in all those little red dots in the Greek world. All those places are having symposia 
pretty much every night and they're drinking and they're making speeches and they're having memorable moments and they're experiencing philoxenia, comforts and sensual sort of surroundings and having sweet figs and pungent olives. All of this is part of Greek life too and is solidifying those um, social networks. So let me go to the most phenomenal example of a social network. And this is a little tiny cup, three inches tall, that was excavated underneath in the demolition of an apartment building in Athens. And it was announced July 30th, 2014. It is such an interesting little piece. So it was broken into 12 bits. I think you can see some of the break lines here, 12 pieces. And when the archaeologists put it back together, they saw that there were um, six rows of letters. And when you read them, you find the names of six men plus a seventh on the base. So the six men are Aristides, Diodotus, Doximos, Arifron, Pericles, and um, Epictetus. And then on the bottom, Drapetes. So this has been uh, endless speculation about what these names are doing here. I've underlined the word Pericles. It is a relatively rare word, but it's confirmed because the name on top of him is Arifron, and that is a super rare word. That's his brother's name and his grandfather's name. So it is Pericles' cup. But probably from when he was kind of young and that his older brother was like <laughs> bringing him around to the parties. So uh, we have a situation here. My belief, um, not mine alone, is that these six men stole <laughs> this cup from their host at a symposium and they were having such a great night, and then they drew straws or did some sort of wager on who could keep it, and Drapetes won. And so his name is on the bottom, and these other six on the side. This was a pauper's grave. It was excavated underneath an apartment building in a pauper's grave, meaning that it didn't really have any grave goods except for this. That was the best night of his life. Yes, it was. And he carried this up. To his grave. So I know um, I want to be able to take uh, some of your questions, but I do want to sort of end with the social network of Socrates. So let me just show you. This is the cluster of Pericles on that on that little cup, and that is the social network of Pericles based on a text called Plutarch's Life of Pericles. And what we have to imagine is that we have all these little clusters and they are all kind of interwoven, interconnected with each other. And, and then they're within larger clusters within, let's say, Athens and then Attica. And then those are connected to all the other city states and it keeps growing. It's a very large, complex adaptive system that we have. So I'm going to skip through this, but I wanted to show that the network of Socrates, when I got to the network of Pericles, I was unhappy with that little diagram in the lower right from Plutarch's life. It wasn't enough for me. I wanted to know how Pericles fit in. And so I decided to do the social network of Socrates by just reading all of Plato and going page by page, looking for pairs of people who were in the same room and knew each other, went to dinner parties together and so on. So here's Pericles in red inside the network of Socrates, which I'm very happy about. I haven't mentioned women much. They do appear, um, they appear in the traditional way, women connect families. And we do know that women had vibrant social lives uh, here they're at the fountain house, they're talking to each other, this is where they can get their news, 
we just don't have as much literary evidence for them. But they could play music and they could read uh, just like the men. So these are the women inside uh, Socrates' um, network. And uh, they aren't very many, but the ones that are, are important ones. Um, and So finally, so we have a network for Socrates, 481 ties between 186 nodes. And that is um, what you're seeing here are the different clusters inside the network of Socrates. Socrates was so attractive um, to foreign philosophers that they moved to Athens. And that is really why Athens became a kind of hot spot for creativity and innovation. People were interested. They came to teach in Athens, to study with Socrates, and then develop their own schools in Athens. Artists and writers and all sorts of creative people came to Athens in part because of social networks that you're seeing like these that reached out to other places. And there's Socrates and his relationships with foreign philosophers who moved here in the lower red, with teachers, with his own sort of circle, Socratics, with intellectuals like Pericles, like playwrights, and then this huge wheel of people that um, are none of the above, regular people. These are the most famous people in his network, and these are the ones who sort of drew in others from around the Greek world and really made Athens famous. Okay, so I'm going to stop here um, because uh, time is run out, but I'm looking forward to your questions. Please post them in the Q&A. And uh, we do have, let's see, one more poll, I believe. Is that correct? You want to put up a poll? Okay. Yes, there you go. Sorry about that. It took a second. Oh, that's fine. So go ahead and we can begin to talk. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, let you have an opportunity to reflect on what we've talked about so far. And we have a few more minutes together, which I'm looking forward to. while people are um, taking this poll, I just want to say thank you for your presentation. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who's already submitted questions. We already have quite a few. Oh, um, goodness. But keep putting them in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, and we're at about 72%, so I'll give it maybe another 15 seconds or so. Sounds great. All right, it looks like we've kind of plateaued, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Thank you for everyone who voted. I'm gonna share the results. Yay, you got the point. <laughs> if you believed it or not, this makes me feel very good, so thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop sharing it. Go ahead and click it, at, or close it out on your screen if it didn't automatically right, disappear. Right. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the questions we've gotten quite a few times um, mm -hmm. is, did this happen elsewhere in the Mediterranean? And if not, what made Greece or Athens so unique? Right, uh, let's see, elsewhere in the Mediterranean, you must be sort of going Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so the Phoenicians who lived in Lebanon primarily uh, and were seafarers like crazy seafarers um, in the 10th, 9th, 8th, 7th centuries BC, before Greece was really getting out of its dark ages. They colonized and went um, mainly to North Africa and Spain, uh, and no doubt had the same kinds of interactions that the Greeks did, of finding people in port, having hospitality, um, trading, 
getting news. I mean, those are, those are things that happen. Uh, however, we do not have a lot of literature to know about them. And that is always the problem for the ancient world. In Italy, for example, in the seventh, sixth, fifth centuries, we were really talking about the eighth, seventh, and sixth centuries BC when Greeks began to leave that homeland and you know colonize all over the, the areas. Italy was hardly anything at that point. You know, they hadn't really even started their history. You had maybe Romulus and Remus, and that's it. Um, so no, they weren't active at the same time. Of course, they became a magnificent empire. Um, right. It's a hard question. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna do- I know we have so many, I'll try to be quicker. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Um, I'm going to take kind of a pivot to a totally different type of question because a lot of people want to know what technologies you use, what algorithms do you find most useful, what software do you use? Um, they're really curious in the technological aspects of your incredible charts. Okay, so um, there are two that I uh, kind of rely on. One is called Node Excel, N-O-D-E-X-L. It is a template for an Excel spreadsheet, which makes it very intuitive um, in that respect. It does have a learning curve, um, but there are great resources on the internet for that. Um, and if I can teach myself, you can teach yours. Um, Note Excel, and that is what is producing these, you know, these charts that you're seeing. Um, for quick and dirty, what you want to do is just make pairs. Let's say. Um, Plutarch's life of Pericles. So Pericles and his mother, Pericles and his father, the father and the mother, um, Pericles' brother Erephron, you know, like that. You just make pairs of what you're reading. And then when you're ready, you cut and paste it and you put it in a website that's called Palladio, P-A-L-L-A-D-I-O. Um, it has a bad URL, like too long. So you search Stanford Palladio because they produce you know, produced it. And then you, it could not be easier. You have a, a, a rectangle and you like paste <laughs> your edge list in and you have to hit a couple buttons and then you've got an image at least. It doesn't have the statistical package, but it has the image. Great, thank you. Um, okay, now jumping back a little bit into the, the content. Yeah. Um, so I know you addressed women a little bit at the end there, but we did get yeah. a bunch of questions about um, did Greek women use networks to serve their purpose? What was their education? How did the mothers know what to teach them, etc.? So if you could speak to that a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, Greek women have a tough time, all right? I mean, married at 15, 16, usually again to bind families together. The, the men, okay, so they have this training that goes on in their teen years, maybe they're in school and they go into military service for 18 to 20, but they're also partnered with an older boy. So if you're the father um, and you see, a, let's say a 20 year old that you want your 12 year old to kind of resemble that he'll grow up to be, that he'll admire. The father matches that boy with your 12 year old, with their 12 year old and they start going to the dinner parties and going to the gymnasium, strolling around, and he might be, you know, discussing a point of the Iliad or something and teaching, but there's also a physical relationship. And that lasts quite a long time, all the way until the boy is 20 and he gets chosen. So that's like another six, you know, 16 years of um, homosexual love relationship that dominates their lives. Then they marry. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor girl is 15 and he's going out to dinner parties okay just going to the symposia every night and so um we do know of very um well educated women how they got educated is sometimes a mystery um sappho for example the great poet one of the first lyric poets uh, aspasia who was um Pericles' girlfriend, uh, after he divorced his wife for her, 
and was from Miletus, one of the great towns on the coast of Turkey today, Anatolia. Um, so yeah, there's that. Thank you. Um, we also got a couple questions about the um, servants, enslaved persons, mm, etc. Sure. Um, did they yeah. have similar opportunities to network like the what we would assume, um, I guess, higher? Uh, yeah, the higher know. class. Yeah, yeah. So we know about them from comedy, from Aristophanes, and he often portrays sort of the you know um, lower world uh, below. You know, these men who are just hanging out looking at boys in the gymnasium. Um, and so the, the, the underclass definitely had um, tight friendships, um, widely knew each other, and new comedy, which is just a little bit later, the, the plots are always, can you get me to someone who knows someone? I'm trying to find this or that. They're always doing networking. Like that's the plot, that's what makes it funny. Um, so, uh, yes, everyone is doing it. Great, thank you. Um, and a couple of people also wanted to know about the role of language in forming social networks. Was um, it important? Um, were Ill illiterate people excluded from the social yeah, networks? Maybe. Hmm. I don't think it depended on writing at all, if that's what you mean, language. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the, the, the the question is, um, but I would say... Uh, so someone did write that they read that most 10% uh, of uh, ancient people were literate. literacy. Okay, generally. Okay. Yeah, not the networks necessarily, but generally, yes. So uh, that is a generous um, uh, estimate, and yet um, Athens is unusual. So they make stone inscriptions for everything. And it's and sometimes duplicates, like one on the Acropolis and one down below. This is what I studied for my dissertation 30 years ago at Princeton. And um, it was 200 Greek inscriptions that were recording what was kept inside the Parthenon in the classical period. And it's like, why would you inscribe every little thing, all the, you know, gold and ivory and furniture and shields and all the junk <laughs> and they put them on these huge huge stone tablets and then they did an audit to make sure that the treasurers the board of 10 had done their job and then they set up the same stele again the next year with one or two more additions like what is that that's literacy that is um, also, um, Freedom of Information Act, <laughs> like, uh, I have the right to know what's in the Parthenon and to know that my treasurers did not steal anything. So Athens is so extraordinary um, for writing. It, it, it really is. And, um, but I think generally the Greek world is extraordinary for writing. If you go to Egypt, it's called hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics, sacred writing, and only the scribes could read it. So I think this person asked um, because they wanted to know if that level of illiteracy put a limit on social networking. Um, again, I don't think it, de it, it de it's person to person oral communication. I don't think writing made a big difference. We do know of some letter writing uh, for, for distant, um, especially for officials. There are these representatives, um, ambassadors, kind of, from different cities to different sanctuaries. They're called Theoroi, and they do send letters um, and need to read letters. Um, but I don't think on a regular basis, like let's say all the people who built the Parthenon, all the different craftsmen involved, that didn't require any literacy, really, um, except maybe for the paymaster. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, so do you, are you, do you believe that this um, format of the social network modeling that you're doing can be consistently applied universally and across time, and it's somehow an ahistorical model, or is it really a modern look at a ancient society? It it is the latter, and and we would just call it modeling, right? I am. I'm really trying to see, you've got a nuclear family, you've got his village, you know, and 
how are these things all interconnected into this spectacular system? And uh, when things are greater than the sum of their parts, like the Parthenon, where you just have low-level, even untrained craftsmen who made that, <laughs> that's the result of a complex adaptive system reaching emergence, which is what happens, you know, beyond the sum of its parts. It's, it's what memory is, the little brain molecules, you know. <laughs> From that, you get memory? How is that possible? It's a miracle, right? So um, that's sort of what I think is going on with their creativity is, I mean, it's over the top. How can Greek tragedy be as amazing as it is? And um, of course it's built up, uh, but it's inspired too. And it's from having a community that, you know, pushes you, makes you, drives you higher competitively. And they did win competitions, annual competitions for the drama. Uh, but there's something else going on that's um, pretty extraordinary. Thank you. Um, so we are just about at time, but if it's okay with you, I'd love to ask maybe two more questions. Of course, of course. Okay. So um, someone wants to know if there are any good books you recommend to learn more about this topic. Oh boy. <laughs> um, for this topic, let's say, okay, so there's a book uh, that's just called Connected, and now I can't remember the author. Um, uh, but it's how everything is connected to everything else. It's an orange book. Um, connected. And maybe someone can put it in the chat if they look real quick on Amazon. And um, gosh, there there are, there are a lot um, uh, of, of general books. Oh dear. So anyway, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything really offhand except for that one. That's okay. And also, Krista you do have Krista Phoebe's is the author, I think. Okay. I was going to say, also, you have a book that dives into oh, well, this. Well, yes, I do. <laughs> I will uh, be happy to plug that. <laughs> so it's um, called The Greeks, an Illustrated History, and it is written for you, like, you know, the intelligent consumer who already knows some about um, Greece, but wants a sort of comprehensive uh, overview of, um, with a, a little bit of a twist, with my own twist, I've selected what I think is important and exciting and fun. And um, it is, uh, it's, so it's called The Greeks and Illustrated History, published in 2016, National Geographic. Um, it was designed to go with a three-part series that was on TV, if you saw that on PBS. And um, yeah, thank you, Heather. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so this next question, it's a little, more, um, I think, modern. So if you don't have an answer to it, please, you know, don't worry okay. about it. Um, but it seems like someone in our group uh, wanted to know, could you share correlations from Greek social networks with current day mastermind and advisory groups? That I cannot. Um, however, <laughs> let me say, I did not finish part of a question before, and this reminded me of it, um, that when I started doing this, um, it was in 2010, and 2012, I published my first bit, you know, with Ale the network of Alexander the Great. And at that time, in 2014, I was a keynote speaker for a new group, a research group that met in Ghent, in Belgium, um, uh, called Historical Network Research. And there were about 40 of us that were there. And they were doing all periods of historical networks, like just trying this. We were all kind of experimenting with it. And so that was 2014. Um, I think that was their second annual. Like, this is how new it is, really. Um, and now, uh, I would say there might be a hundred of us. Um, it's definitely growing in interest. Uh, and there are maybe one or two others doing Greece, uh, more doing Rome. There's more material for Rome, to be honest. There's just more literary evidence to use. Uh, and I've done Socrates, which is the obvious. <laughs> so um, it's a growing field, and it is applicable for, for most. Um, now, I would say for modern, you want to use what organizational development consultants do. 
uh, like Valdez Krebs at the beginning, where they go into an organization, they will use surveys. We can't do that. They use surveys and they say, who do you trust? Who would you take out for lunch? Who would you go to in a pinch? Um, who has the most information? Um, who do you see outside of work? All of those kinds of questions. Then they tabulate it, they, they score it basically, and you get, you know, you have your org chart, CEO, manager level, and all the workers, okay? But then after the, so the uh, organizational development consultant's been there, you get like it's all mixed up and you see who are those nodes like who are those people one's always the secretary she he should get a parking spot should get a raise like what would you do if you took him out you're taking out muhammad atta <laughs> <laughs> this is your person so that's what that's useful for if that helps oh i think it does thank you um, okay, and finally, um, given the geographic distances and the tendencies of travelers and traders to assimilate into longstanding local customs and ways of life, how could the Greek culture be retained for so long? Mm. The other places around them assimilated to them. So Greek life in those places survived centuries and really um, they were still Greek towns when the Romans came over. Uh, they remained Greek towns um, because they are part of a network. On your own, yes, you'll assimilate. But having a place in this network with people depending on you, you know, and expecting from you certain behaviors and the, these customs, especially of the wine and the olive oil use and the dependence on that, and then having to always be making it and making enough pots for it and all of that, it's um, an entrapment that keeps you where you are. It's hard to let go of it. It's hard to change. And so it's retained century after century. Yeah. Great, thank you. So that's all the time we have to for Hi. today. Okay. <laughs> I know. Um, thank you, Diane, for your wonderful uh, presentation, and thank you to all our viewers for joining us and your great questions. I'm yes. sorry we did not get to all of them. There were over 55, um, so a lot of questions tonight. Um, but if you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider becoming a member or making a donation to support educational programs like this. And definitely check out all our other upcoming programs. You can find all those details on our website, smithsonianassociates.org. Um, when you uh, leave, we encourage you to fill out our anonymous survey. We want to hear from you. We value your input. Um, thank you again, and we will see you soon.